Hi students, in this video uh, I'm going to talk about uh, political parties and political issues during the late 19th and early 20th century. In particular, I'm going to talk about political corruption and I'm going to talk about the money supply and the currency issue. And so we begin with the political parties, the political parties that for this period hold very similar positions. Uh, participation in your local party was in many ways more of a social activity, a social statement than it was a statement of one set of strongly convicting views, which is normally what we associate with membership of a political party today. Uh, the political parties were also known to be corrupt. Uh, that they were run by party bosses who made sure that those who voted for them were rewarded, who expected um, to be rewarded by those who they put into office. When we look at, uh, when we take a political overview of this period, uh, we see that it's a really quite a, a balanced political structure. There's relatively little, little to choose between the two parties, and that's kind of reflected in uh, the course of elections during this period. From 1872 to 1896, no president won the popular vote. Uh, so winning the popular vote is not something that's necessarily associated with the presidency, perhaps until we get to the 20th century even then. But it was quite typical at this time for presidents to be elected by the Electoral College, according to the Constitution, um, and that popular vote did not play a, a significant role in who won the election that during this period there were about 15 states on one side that consistently voted Republican, there were about 15 states on the other side that always voted Democrat, and there were six swing states in the middle that were contested. In general, the presidents are not particularly influential leaders. Uh, they defer to the leader of the Senate and the Speaker in Congress to develop governing agendas, um, along the lines of their party platforms. And the presidents present themselves as much more as uh, implementers of legislation rather than the minds that are shaping and envisioning legislation. Uh, just to run through the presidents uh, quickly here, we have Rutherford B. Hayes, who comes to office uh, in the confusion of the election of 1876. Even though Hayes governed as someone who was trying to reform corrupt politics at both the local and the national level, he's someone who's always under a cloud because of um, the circumstances in which he came to office, because of this very confusing and corrupt election that had made him president. He's succeeded by James Garfield, a former Civil War soldier, who is a reformer, but someone who is, wants to see reform more at the local level than at the national level. So someone who's not um, promoting big agendas as president, which is typical of this time period. Uh, Garfield, Garfield is assassinated uh, by someone who uh, was, seems to have been clinically insane, but someone who thought uh, that if Garfield's vice president became president, he would receive a, a position of influence and wealth under the old patronage system. However, Garfield's vice president, Chester Arthur, when he becomes uh, president himself, recognizes uh, that popular opinion is trending towards reform at this time. And so instead, he also governs as a reformer, even though he had a reputation for being uh, corrupt uh, before his time in office. He sees uh, the enactment of the Pendleton Act, which establishes that at least 15% of all government employees have to be uh, hired on competitive grounds rather than simply chosen as favorites. And this was seen as a movement in the direction of reform, uh, an improvement of a corrupt political system. Arthur is succeeded by Grover Cleveland, uh, a Democrat, and Cleveland is famous for uh, reducing the tariffs. 
He said, we've had tariffs for a long time to protect growing American industries. They don't need protection anymore. The people who need protection are consumers who are having to pay higher prices uh, on goods that have tariffs attached to them. Uh, this made Cleveland unpopular with big businesses who uh, were used to uh, charging higher prices under the tariffs and leads to Cleveland being defeated by Benjamin Harrison in the election uh, that follows. Okay, that's kind of a run through of the presidents. And now for the rest of this video, I'm going to talk a little bit about the issues of currency. This is always an issue in early American history. Um, should currency be based on paper or should it be based in precious metals? If it's best in, based in paper, there's more of it. It means consumers can buy more. It means that prices are probably going to be a little bit lower. It means that interest rates are going to be lower for those who want to buy property. If the currency is based on precious metals, it means that currency will be worth more. It will be more stable, uh, but also that economic growth will be slower and fewer people will be able to afford to buy land and to buy property. By uh, about 1890, the money supply in the United States had actually decreased 10% since 1865, at the same time as the population was increasing. So the value of an individual dollar was very high, but access to wealth was very difficult. Interest rates were also very high. And so we start to see that this issue is especially affecting farmers in the Midwest. So we're talking about American expansion into the Midwest at the time. Now we're looking at these people and how they're being affected by this economic situation. Why does this particularly affect them? It's because they are the ones who most need loans in order to establish farms and to pay for land. And what they see is that they're trying to get established and they're having to take out loans at very high interest rates and from banks that are based on the East Coast who are making money off them by virtue of the fact that there's so little actual currency in the system. And these farmers also come to resent uh, the railroads, the railroads which they rely on in order to ship their goods to the markets that are going to receive them. Otherwise, they have no one to sell to. But of course, railroads cost a lot of money to build. There are only a certain number of them. If you don't like the price that a railroad is charging, there isn't another railroad that you can choose to do business with. And so many of these farmers are trapped in this cycle of high interest rates, high prices to ship uh, their goods to market. And that's associated with falling crop prices. Why are crop prices falling? Because through industry and technological innovation, uh, crops are becoming easier to produce. So there are more crops, farmers are receiving less money from, uh, from what they grow. And if they grow more, they just receive less money because the price continues to drop. And at the same time, uh, they are facing higher and higher prices in order to take out the loans that they need in order to ship their goods to buyers and sellers, which is further eroding their profit line. And so this resentment on the farmers leads to the development of the populist movement and the populist party in 1892. And the populist party advocates for an income tax a federal income tax, which hadn't been the case bef before. There was one during the Civil War, but it was allowed to lapse. They saw this as kind of evening the playing field uh, for, for them against rich bankers on the East Coast who are making money through these high interest loans. Uh, they wanted to see more money printed and they wanted to see uh, in order to give them access to lower interest rates. And uh, they wanted to see immigration restricted in order that their labor would, the value of their labor would go up. The populist movement becomes even more popular in 1893 when the economy suffers another recession. Uh, these are very standard uh, during the second half of the 19th century, they occur about every 15 or 20 years or so. But the Panic of 1893 until the Great Depression was the Great Depression. Um, and so uh, you have period where banks, uh, a couple of railroads go bust, banks get spooked, um, 
and they don't have um, because currency is in short supply they don't have the money that they need to kind of pay out investors and so investors start withdrawing as much of their money as they can banks can't cover all of their losses and you have an economic meltdown that president cleveland actually makes worse by trying to further shrink the money supply his idea is that he's making each dollar more valuable uh, but the problem is that there is uh, it's increasing the panic uh, which is worsening the economic situation the election of 1896 in response to this uh, the democrats move on from cleveland and instead they nominate uh, president uh, mckinley and uh, mckinley who doubles down on uh, cleveland's positions um, I hope I said McKinley is a Republican. I'm not sure, but I, I think I did. So the Republicans uh, nominate McKinley. The Democrats nominate a populist so that popular supporters will, um, will side with them. A populist named William Jennings Bryan, who is um, a powerful speaker in favor of populist demands, but someone who is seen as a fanatic, um, who is seen as anti-Catholic by Catholics in the Midwest, who is seen as a threat to their financial success by bankers in the Northeast. And so in the end, in the election is unsuccessful. And McKinley becomes president. And these issues with American currency, the lack of access to currency for farmers in the Midwest will continue. 